Parliamo di estinzioni. Ci sono estinzioni lente, un rumore di fondo è scritto nel libro eh, di cui parliamo oggi, estinzioni che fanno sparire una specie in media ogni 700 anni. E poi ci sono estinzioni improvvise, sempre in modo relativo, che arrivano di colpo. Finora se ne sono contate 5 negli ultimi 500 milioni di anni. Potremmo essere alla vigilia della sesta e drammaticamente potrebbe trattarsi della nostra. Elizabeth Colbert, giornalista newyorkese, ha vinto con questo libro appunto la sesta edizione la sesta estinzione edizioni Neri Pozza il premio Pulitzer 2015 per la saggistica ha condotto personalmente un'indagine alla ricerca degli animali che non ci sono più o che stanno scomparendo e l'elenco è notevole poi nella sua relazione ce ne farà ovviamente un elenco più aggiornato comincia con le rane dalle zampe d'oro di Panama i mastodonti dell'Ohio, l'alca dell'Islanda e dell'isola di Terranova, le tartarughe giganti, giganti delle Galapagos e via dicendo. Il libro è scritto in modo divertente, si scopre che può esistere un rapporto tra la scomparsa delle ammoniti, un meteorite e Lady Gaga. Poi ci spiegherà lei come, come è possibile. Vi aggiungo una curiosità, la ricerca potrebbe proseguire anche a poche centinaia di metri da qua, da questo posto, perché c'è il, di poco qui, proprio qui vicino c'è il Museo di Scienze Naturali di Torino, dove zoologi darwiniani come Michele Lessona hanno portato nell'Ottocento esemplari impagliati di specie ora estinte, come il lupo marsupiato della Tasmania, scomparso all'inizio degli anni 30 del Novecento, o il quagga, che è una specie di cavallo estinto a metà dell'Ottocento. C'è stato un momento in cui ci si preoccupava di fare, diciamo, memoria di quello che l'umanità era stata, di quello che l'ambiente era stato, se non altro per curiosità scientifica, ma anche forse per ripromettersi di provare a conservare quello che rimaneva. Ma non è tanto sulle teorie delle catastrofi, contrapposte a quelle dell'evoluzione graduale della selezione darwiniana, una discussione che ha animato l'Ottocento nel mondo, che si incentra il libro. Perché anche senza la, teori- senza la teoria delle catastrofi, qualsiasi approccio darwiniano escluderebbe l'idea che bastino 5.000 anni di civiltà umana, sostanzialmente molto poco, per provocare l'estinzione della specie. Quindi dobbiamo immaginare che se ci estingueremo, diciamo, rapidamente è perché un'altra catastrofe è vicina. Quello che si racconta è infatti come sia possibile che a differenza delle altre cinque che l'hanno preceduta, la la sesta estinzione possa essere causata dai disastri creati dalla specie umana, che a questo punto diventa una specie infestante, come le erbacce nel giardino, e che in fondo, distruggendo l'ambiente in cui viviamo, finiamo per mettere a rischio la nostra stessa specie. Ascoltiamo dunque la relazione di Elizabeth Colbert e poi proveremo a discuterla. Um, Thank you all. Uh, Thanks for coming out on such a beautiful afternoon and for inaugurating, I guess, inaugurating this hall, all of us together. Um, So I wanted to start out this afternoon by, can can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, And you brave people who are listening in English, I appreciate that. Um, By issuing um, a little bit of uh, an apology because I I published this book, The Sixth Extinction, um, about two years ago. And around the time the book came out, I gave a bunch of of talks on it. And one of the responses that I got to these talks was, uh, that was really interesting and alarming, um, but you didn't tell us what we should do in response. 
And I know that the theme of the Biennial this year is emergency exit, um, what we should do in response to emergencies, both real and manufactured. And I am definitely going to argue um, this afternoon that the uh, extinction crisis is a real emergency, um, but I am not going to end up by telling you uh, what I think we should do, what the response should be, um, because I don't really have an answer to that question. So I'm warning you uh, about that up front. Uh, and um, to be honest, these problems have only become more and more difficult uh, in recent months since the election in the US, and I'm sure you have all read about a lot of rollback of our environmental regulations uh, in the states. Um, so as I talk, I will ask you to uh, think about what you think uh, we should do. What is the appropriate response to this information that I'm sharing with you this afternoon? Because you are all uh, knowledgeable people and people who are concerned, obviously, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So I'm starting uh, with this fellow, this bird, uh, who's one of my favorite characters from the book. Uh, his name is Kanoe, and he is a Hawaiian crow, or what's known in the Hawaiian language uh, as an alala. And he looks a lot like the crows that we have all across North America, and also uh, you have a very closely related species of crow uh, here, the carrion crow here in uh, Europe. Um, but there are actually some important differences. His beak is fatter, for example, if you're a bird person, uh, and so are his legs. Uh, so before humans arrived in the Hawaiian archipelago, so Hawaii is a collection of islands, um, there were actually several species of crows, and which probably diverged from the crows on the mainland of North America several hundred thousand years ago. So this is a story um, for all of you who have studied Darwin, a bit like Darwin's finches in the Galapagos, where an animal arrives somehow, we're not entirely sure how, on an archipelago, and then it speciates out to fill different niches and survive in different sorts of habitat. And the only difference is that in the case of the Hawaiian crows, only, only one species survived into modern times. Um, so this is the only one. Uh, the Alala, and it's native to an island that we in the States call the Big Island. And this bird, the Alala, is now also extinct in the wild. So the last wild birds were seen in 2002. And there are probably a number of reasons that it's extinct in the wild. Um, loss of habitat, so loss of the native forests in Hawaii, uh, and also introduced species that eat uh, small birds, so for example, mongoose, were introduced into Hawaii by humans. And also introduced into Hawaii were mosquitoes that carry uh, avian malaria. Okay, so malaria that birds, uh, has killed a lot of birds. So a few decades before the last wild alalas died out, people realized that the bird was in very, very deep trouble. So they took some of them out of the forest, um, or what's left of the forest on the Big Island um, and into a, a breeding facility um, on a different island on the island of Maui. And this is where my friend Kanoe himself was born. And he is what we would say in English, I don't know if there's an equivalent um, expression in Italian, a very odd duck. Um, he was raised by people and he does not really see himself as a bird. He does not self-identify as a bird. Uh, or at least not as a crow. Uh, so one of the women who takes care of him told me that he once uh, fell in love uh, with a bird called a spoonbill. So Kanoe um, was at this breeding facility, and <clears throat> at this point there are maybe 100 birds left, so 50 females, uh, all the alalas left on the whole world. And he refused to mate, since he does not identify as a crow, uh, he refused to mate with any of the females. Um, and he's pretty old now, and for precisely that reason, he's, he's more than 20 years old, uh, and so for precisely that reason, his genes are considered extremely important. So a couple of years ago, they took him from this breeding facility on the island of Maui and flew him to California, so several thousand miles, 3,000 miles away, 
and he came to live at the San Diego Zoo. And there he came under the care of, um, of what's known as a reproductive physiologist, a woman by the name of Barbara Durant. And every spring, when it's mating season back in Maui, uh, this woman, Barbara Durant, takes Kanoe on her lap and she strokes him in a way that he is supposed to find very, very exciting. And she is hoping that Kanoe will uh, give up, as it were, some of his genetic material. And then she will fly back with it to Maui uh, and try to artificially inseminate one of the crows back in Maui. So when I was uh, in San Diego, she offered to introduce me to Kanoe, and he turns out to be a very uh, charismatic, if um, sexually confused, bird. So he has this very grand palatial cage, and he hopped over to see us. It's so big that you can stand in his cage. Uh, and it seemed to me that he definitely recognized this woman, Barbara Durant. Um, he seemed a little bit embarrassed to see her. Um, that, that may be projection, but he seemed uh, embarrassed by their sort of intimate relationship. Um, and she had brought with him some um, snacks for him, some little tiny mice. Uh, which are so young, they have no hair, they're called pinkies. Uh, and he hopped over uh, to eat these uh, little mice. And crows, as I'm sure you know, are very, very smart. Um, they can imitate human speech. And so Kanoe says, uh, I know. That's what he's learned to say. It sounds a little bit crazy when he says it, um, but he says, I know. And so to me, Kanoe has sort of come to symbolize this very, very strange situation that we humans find ourselves in. Because here we have this crow, one of the very last representatives of his species. And people are going to these great lengths, enormous lengths, to save this species. They have set up this breeding facility. Um, they are, in effect, uh, giving hand jobs to crows. So people really do care about animals and about what the American author Rachel Carson called uh, the problem of sharing our earth with other creatures. Uh, but at the same time, as you know, uh, we as a species uh, are killers. We are driving more and more species to the brink, like the Alala, to the very brink of extinction, and we are driving more and more species over the brink into extinction. So Kanoe uh, sort of came to symbolize to me um, an emblem of this sort of great mess uh, that we've gotten ourselves into. And it seems very appropriate that he wears this sort of black uh, cape that you see. So what is the sixth extinction? Um, obviously, when you have the sixth of anything, the implication is that there have been five uh, other ones. And that is indeed uh, the case. Um, <clears throat> What you are looking at in this slide is an analysis of the marine fossil record. So it looks like a little bit of a complicated graph, but it's actually pretty simple. What you're looking at there on the vertical axis is the number of families in the record. And here on the horizontal axis, you're looking at time, starting with 600 million years ago, going forward. And those are the geological periods down there on the bottom there. So what you can see whenever we see those big dips, those are just points where the number of families and the marine fossil record suddenly dropped. And those of you who have taken introductory biology, uh, you remember that a family is the group that's just above a genus, and the genus is a group that's above a species. So if one species from one of these families made it through this extinction event, then that family counts as a survivor. So in these events where you see those sudden dips, those are moments in time where something like 75% of all species on Earth were lost. So these are the five uh, major mass extinctions. They are sometimes called the big five. Um, and they're just moments, once again, geologically speaking, not moments in a human scale, but moments in a geological scale where for some reason, diversity of life on the planet plummeted. 
So one pretty good description of a mass extinction, which comes from two British paleontologists that I quote in um, my book, is that mass extinctions are events that eliminate a significant proportion of the world's biota in a geologically insignificant amount of time. So the first of these extinctions, where you see the number one there, uh, that occurred at the end of what's known as the Ordovician period. That was 440 million years ago. Uh, and at that time, life was still mostly confined to the oceans. So that was a terribly devastating event if you were a marine creature, uh, not so much for other life, simply because there was no other life. And the fifth, number five there, that was the event that killed off the dinosaurs about 66 million years ago. Uh, the most famous uh, of all mass extinctions. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, there's very broad consensus now that that event was caused by an asteroid impact. And the first uh, evidence for that uh, was uh, collected not that far from here uh, in Gubbio, outside Gubbio. Um, <clears throat> I can't show you uh, a photo of that, obviously, of that asteroid impact, uh, but this is a, a drawing that I like. So to say that we are in the sixth extinction is obviously a uh, very serious claim to make. Uh, and the reason that we're in the sixth, and some scientists would say we're on the verge of it, we can still prevent it, and some would say that we're fairly deep into it already, uh, is that we are changing the world very, very radically and very, very fast. So not unlike an asteroid impact. So how are we doing this? How are we behaving like an asteroid? Well, unfortunately, there's actually a lot of ways. Um, but this afternoon, I'm going to talk about three that, for various reasons, seem to be the most significant. So it's how we're changing the atmosphere, how we're changing the oceans, and how we're changing what Charles Darwin called the principles of geographical distribution. So let's start with the atmosphere. Every year, uh, we humans are adding 10 uh, billion tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Uh, this is coming, uh, for the most part, from burning fossil fuels. You all know this, so I'm not going to belabor it. Uh, it's very ordinary stuff. Uh, we drive our cars. Uh, we turn on our lights. Uh, there are now 7.5 billion people on the planet, uh, and it adds up very, very quickly. And what we are doing when we burn fossil fuels is we are taking carbon that got buried under the earth over the course of hundreds of millions of years, and we are transferring it back to the atmosphere very, very quickly. So we are basically running geological history backwards and at a very high speed. We are taking a process that uh, took hundreds of millions of years to run in one direction, and we're running it backwards in the other direction, uh, in a matter of decades. <clears throat> so if you were an alien, let's say, and you came uh, to Earth from another planet, you could easily conclude that what we are doing, that the primary purpose of a uh, modern 21st century industrialized society is to effect this transfer as quickly as possible, to see how much carbon we can get out of the ground and put up into the air and how fast we can do it. Uh, and if the aliens were measuring this process, these, they'd see that we are, in fact, increasing the amount of CO2 in the air every single day. Uh, and of course, we are measuring this process. Uh, we are measuring it. This brings us back to Hawaii. Uh, there's a continuous record of carbon dioxide in the air that's been taken uh, from what's called the Mauna Loa Observatory, uh, very high up on a very high peak uh, in Hawaii. Um, and this is where we have a record of CO2 in the air. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. This is a very famous graph. This is showing us uh, CO2 uh, levels in the air in parts per million there on the vertical axis, and then once again, time. So since 1958, we have a continuous record. Uh, and I'm sure, that, so that's a very latest reading, very recent reading, 406 parts per million. Uh, where that green line is shows where we hit 400 parts per million. So there's a seasonal component to CO2, that, that sort of sawtooth pattern that you're seeing. Uh, when it's winter in the northern hemisphere and our trees drop their leaves, 
uh, go dormant and stop photosynthesizing, stop taking up CO2 for photosynthesis, then globally carbon dioxide levels go up. And during the summer, when the trees in the northern hemisphere start taking up CO2 again, then globally CO2 levels go down. And that is just a function of the fact that we have more forests and, in fact, more land in the northern hemisphere. And we are now at the end of winter, right? So we're at a high point, and then CO2 levels will start to decline now in the spring. Um, but that general up and down pattern will keep going, but the general rise up is going to keep on going uh, until we stop emitting CO2, which unfortunately, uh, so far, we show no signs uh, of doing. Uh, so probably, in fact, certainly, uh, within the lifetimes of anyone in this room, uh, CO2 is not going down below 400 parts per million. Uh, we've reached the point where it's only going to be above that. Uh, and if we want to see how well we're doing on a longer time scale, uh, so how well are we doing at increasing CO2 levels in the air, uh, we don't have a continuous you know, record from Hawaii, but we do have um, a very interesting record that were collected from ice sheets. So here is a photo of an ice coring operation that I actually visited just last summer. Uh, we're on the Greenland ice sheet here, and we're standing on top of 10,000 feet of ice, okay? So that is um, how thick the Greenland ice sheet is. And if you take an ice core, uh, what you do is you take a drill that just looks like a long tube, and you set it spinning uh, in the ice, and if you're lucky, you pull out a cylinder of ice like that, uh, which is about a meter long and a few centimeters in diameter. And you keep doing it over and over and over again until you reach the bottom of the ice sheet. And what that ice sheet has in it are trapped uh, bubbles of air, so we have actual samples uh, of the atmosphere going back a very, very long way. And the very longest uh, record that we have actually comes from ice sheets on Antarctica. So this is a, a graph showing you the record of CO2 from the longest core we have uh, taken on Antarctica. It's called the Epica core. It was taken by a group of European scientists. Very, very arduous uh, labor. Uh, and what you're looking at here is 800,000 years of carbon dioxide in the air, okay? So parts per million versus time, 800,000 years ago to today. And where you see those up and down cycles, those are the glacial cycles, right? So times when CO2 is low, the ice sheets have uh, pushed down from uh, the North Pole, uh, covered most of, most of Scandinavia. Uh, there have been huge ice sheets on the Alps, uh, and even ice sheets here uh, at the higher elevations here in Italy. Uh, and those times where CO2 is low, those are interglacials, right? So we are obviously uh, in an interglacial uh, right now. <clears throat> and now you see how we've radically changed the shape of that curve, right? So you are up there, once again, near 400 parts per million. And this graph shows us if we look into the future, okay? So this is the same record, 800,000 years of CO2. Uh, this used to be um, kept by a federal agency in the U.S. Uh, they stopped doing it in 2008. I think the numbers were getting too scary. Uh, now we're getting up over 400 parts per million. Uh, where you see that green dot, that is where we're headed if we work very, very hard to keep our emissions low, so up around 550 parts per million. Uh, and that yellow dot is where we're headed if we just keep on our merry way uh, and keep dumping CO2 in the atmosphere the way we are now, we're headed up almost to 900 parts per million, so roughly triple uh, where we were before. Uh, so if we want to go even further back, uh, we run out of ice. We don't even have ice that's old enough. Um, but there are other ways of trying to figure out what CO2 levels were like in the atmosphere. Um, for example, by looking at the shells of tiny little marine creatures that drifted down to the bottom of the ocean. And these methods are not as exact, uh, but they give us a pretty good picture. And it turns out that if you want to find CO2 levels that are as <clears throat> significantly higher than today's, uh, you have to go back very far in the record. You have to go back at least 20 million years. Uh, so if we keep just dumping CO2 in the air the way we are right now, we could very easily reach levels from 20 million years ago. That's a period called the Miocene uh, within the next couple of decades. Uh, and if we keep on going, dumping CO2 in the air, then we will uh, 
be, in a sense, also running geological history back, we will see have CO2 levels that have not been seen on Earth uh, for 50 million years uh, since a period called the Eocene. Uh, and in the Eocene, it's important to remember, there were not any people around, right? So 50 million years ago, our own species is only about 200,000 years old. Uh, so 50 million years ago, there were certainly no humans around, and there were barely any primates around at that point. So what's significant about this, as you all know, uh, as I'm sure uh, the students in here have studied, uh, is that CO2 has certain geophysical properties that make it a greenhouse gas. And I'm not going to give you my whole global warming spiel uh, this afternoon, because you all know it, but it's pretty basic science. This property of CO2, that it's a greenhouse gas, uh, has been understood for more than 150 years. So I'm showing you, uh, I can't really emphasize this point enough. I, I don't know that you have this problem here in Italy, but we have a lot of people in high positions now in the US who are making the argument that the science of climate change is not settled. Uh, but that is, um, not to be too blunt about it, um, garbage, really. Uh, the science has been settled for a very long time. So this machine was invented by a British uh, physicist named John Tyndall. Uh, it's called a spectrophotometer. He used it to measure the properties of certain gases. And back in the 1850s, he realized that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas, a gas that traps heat near the surface of the Earth. So if you know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and you know that we're adding a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere, then you would expect temperatures to rise. That would just be a, a, a sort of automatic uh, expectation. And as you know, that's exactly what's happening. So the next gra graph I'm going to show you, it's not a slide, it's not a slide, it's a little video. You have to just wait a couple seconds and it will start. And it's showing you what has happened to temperatures since we had accurate temperature records with thermometers, which started back in the 1880s. Okay, so this, uh, just give this one second to start. So we're seeing a record of what's happening to temperatures. So if you s followed the negotiations about, we're just, it's just going to start again, um, about the Paris Accord that was negotiated in 2015, there was a goal of trying to keep uh, average global temperature increase below 2 degrees Celsius, that's that outer line, and then within the Paris Agreement there was also this sort of aspirational goal, let's try to keep the temperature increase uh, below 1.5 degrees C. Uh, but you see from this graph that we are very, very close already to 1.5 degrees C. Um, so this is just another way to look at some of the same information. This is just showing you the warmest years on record. Uh, 2016 was a very warm year, by far the warmest year on record. You see how it really broke a lot of uh, records. It's also showing you once again how we're very close uh, to that 1.5 degrees C mark. And then it shows you that 2015 was the warmest year before 2016, and that 2014 was the warmest year before that. So the question, obviously, is what, what does this mean for, for living things, for the other creatures with whom we share this planet? And one thing that is um, important to note, I'm just going to show you this si slide very quickly. Um, this is showing you the difference in temperature increase, right? So where it's very red, that's where the temperature has risen the most. Uh, and you see that it's the Arctic. Um, the very northern latitudes have seen the most warming. Um, this is if an effect that was predicted a long time ago. It's called the Arctic amplification. Uh, so we see the greatest temperature increase towards the North Pole. Uh, and it's the reason that the um, polar bear has sort of become an icon of the effects of climate change. Um, but one of the points I want to make to you this afternoon, uh, and it's not really my point, I want to emphasize this, it's a point that would be made by scientists, um, is that the effects of climate change are likely to be felt most by those species uh, that live in the tropics. Um, and the reason for this, there's a few reasons for this, but the major reason for this is actually that most species do live in the tropics. The richness of life on Earth is much, much richer uh, towards the equator. So let's take, for example, 
the example of trees, okay? So here we are looking down, we're in Peru. This is a slide taken in Peru, uh, in a cloud forest in Peru. Uh, and you're looking down from an elevation uh, of about uh, 12,000 feet. And I went to the spot where this picture was taken um, a couple of years ago with an American uh, scientist. And this um, scientist and his students uh, had mapped out these plots uh, of one hectare each going down that ridge that you're looking at, okay? So they had measured them out at different altitudes, and then they had put tape around them, and then every tree in this one hectare plot, they had identified the species that it comes from, and they'd measured it and tagged it. So that's one of the representatives, okay? So they had these 20 plots, each one hectare, so 20 hectares total. And within that 20 hectares, they'd found 1,000 different species of trees. So if you went uh, further north, let's say you went to Canada, which has a very large stretch of boreal forest that's still intact, covers about a billion acres, or yeah, about maybe, maybe 400,000 hectares. Uh, I'm sorry, 400 million hectares. Uh, you would find only 50 species of trees in all that territory. So you see that there's a very, very big difference in the number of species uh, that live in the tropics versus those that live up where we are now in the northern latitudes. So by tagging these trees and marking them and coming back year after year, this American scientist was trying to, and his students were trying to figure out how these species of trees, which are very, very narrowly adapted uh, to, the, to their climate zone, uh, are keeping up with climate change. So to track the climate, to stay with the same climate that they're used to, they were going to move, have to move upslope, up the Andes, okay? Um, and they were going to have to move at a rate of several meters per year because that's how fast the climate in the Andes is, is changing. So of course, trees don't actually get up and move, um, but they can do sort of the next best thing, which is that they put out their seeds, and if their conditions are right, the seeds get moved around, and the seeds will survive in new places. So we'll get that species, representatives of that species in new places. Um, and what they found, and they've been doing this work for about a decade and a half now, is that some trees are, are moving very fast. Some species are moving fast enough um, to track the climate. So that is that, let's say, you used to find uh, a certain species only at 2,000 meters. Maybe now you find it at 2,100 meters. Um, but the vast majority of species are not moving. Um, they're just sort of sitting there. And so these tree communities, these communities um, which have been very stable in the tropics going back many thousands of years, where, where, for example, where we never had ice sheets, um, they're beginning to break down. Uh, and then the question that occurs to you is, what is going to happen to the other creatures that depend on these forests? So the insects, the birds, the mammals. Um, and when you think about it, that's actually obviously a lot harder to study, right? Because a, a, an insect doesn't sit there while you, you know, nail a tag into its head, uh, and it doesn't live very long. Um, but people are trying to figure out um, how to, to track this, how to see uh, what, what's happening to these communities that depend on these, on these tree communities that are now breaking down. And as this American scientist, whose name is, is Miles Silman, observed to me, um, unfortunately, we are going to find out the answer to this question because we have set this experiment in motion, right? Without doing any controls, we have set this experiment in motion on the whole planet. Uh, so we're going to find out the answer to it, whether we want to or not. So how, how else are we changing the planet? Well, it turns out, as you probably know, that global warming is only one of the impacts of dumping 10 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. Uh, there's also what's often called global warming's equally evil twin, um, which is ocean acidification. So ocean acidification happens um, because if you <clears throat> dump a lot of CO2 into the air, a lot of it pretty quickly gets uh, dissolved in the water. And when you dissolve CO2 in water, you get an acid. Uh, if you had carbonated, if you had any kind of aqua frizzante today, you drank it. It's not a very uh, strong acid, but it is an acid. Um, and if you dump enough of it into the water, you start to change the chemistry of the water. 
And this is a teeny bit, the actual chemistry of this is a teeny bit complicated. I'm not gonna uh, go into it uh, very much today, but as I say, all you really need to know is that CO2 dissolved uh, in water is, is carbonic acid. So here are the very, very basics uh, of ocean acidification. Um, the oceans have absorbed about a third of the carbon dioxide we've put up into the air since the start of the Industrial Revolution. That's about 150 billion metric tons. Um, every four hours, the seas absorb another, four, another <clears throat> million metric tons of CO2. And the net result uh, is that the acidity of the oceans has already increased by about 30%. So we don't live in the oceans, um, and we don't have a very intuitive sense of what it means to change the chemistry of the water. Uh, but if you're a creature that does live in the oceans, you're obviously your entire interaction with the outside world occurs through the water. And one thing that is pretty clear is that by uh, acidifying the oceans, um, we are making it more difficult for any creature that builds a shell or an external skeleton out of the mineral calcium carbonate. Um, just because of the way the chemistry of the water is changing, it gets harder and harder for these creatures to build uh, their shells. And there turn out to be an awful lot of marine creatures who need to do this. So this is just uh, a couple of examples. Um, these are very, very tiny creatures called coccolithophores. Uh, they're so small you can't see them with the naked eye. Um, this is under high magnification. Uh, they are at the very bottom of the marine food chain. If you've ever seen pictures uh, where a whole stretch of the ocean turns a sort of milky color, that's because there's a bloom of these coccolithophores. And if you've ever been to the White Cliffs of Dover in England, most of that is coccolithophores laid down over many, many millions of years at the bottom of the sea. Um, common shellfish that we like to eat, so oysters and mussels and clams, uh, they need to assemble their shells out of calcium carbonate. Sea urchins, uh, they are also assembling those shells and their spines out of calcium carbonate. Starfish, this is a very uh, beautiful blue starfish you see in the South Pacific. Uh, they are assembling their external skeletons out of calcium carbonate and corals, stony corals, hard corals. Uh, are a, a coral reef is essentially just a vast a collection of calcium carbonate that's been excreted by these tiny little creatures. So to give you actually a sense of what an acidified ocean looks like, um, I'm gonna show you some, some slides, some photos, some underwater pictures of a really interesting place I visited, uh, once again, not that far from here. Uh, I visited it with some British and Italian scientists a few years ago, um, and also with a photographer actually from National Geographic who took the pictures uh, you're about to see. So just to sort of explain this setup here, we are now in the Bay of Naples, off of Ischia. Um, and this is an area, as you know, where there's a lot of volcanic activity. And one of the impacts of that is that you get these bubbles of CO2, almost pure carbon dioxide that is coming up out of the ocean floor. Um, you don't see that here, you'll see that in the next slide. So what these scientists figured out was that this was sort of a very interesting way to look at what happens when you acidify the water, right? So we are pouring CO2 into the water from above, but in the Bay of Naples, you're actually getting CO2 coming up from below. So it's sort of a natural experiment in ocean acidification. So here we are far away from these vents, these, these bubbles. Uh, and you see this is a very colorful, it's a collection of sort of creatures we'd expect to see in the Mediterranean. There is a sea urchin in the front there, so there are some corals here. Um, there are these very stiff kind of seaweed, which also has uh, a sort of external skeleton made out of calcium carbonate. And now imagine we're swimming along. When I was there, it was January. We had to go in the water in January when it was clear, uh, and it was a it was the coldest experience of my life. Um, but now we are swimming towards these volcanic vents and the acidity of the water is increasing and the pH is decreasing, okay? So once again, all you students, higher pH, more alkaline, right? So now we're seeing the pH decline. 
So now the pH is down to about 7.8. We are closer to the vents, we're seeing the bubbles, and we're seeing that a lot of that colorful life has just disappeared. Okay, so this is what an acidified uh, ocean, a naturally acidified bay looks like. And if you uh, can read that box, this appeared in National Geographic. So at, if, we, if we keep just pouring CO2 into the air, uh, then by 2100, by the end of this century, the pH of all of the surface waters of the oceans in the world will be at 7.8, will have fallen to 7.8, uh, and quite possibly all of our oceans uh, will look like this natural experiment here. So another place that I went with scientists who are studying ocean acidification was the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a tiny island. It sort of just peaks up above the reef. There's a research station there uh, called One Tree Island. Um, so Charles Darwin, when he went on the voyage of the Beagle, he did not visit the Great Barrier Reef, but he visited reefs in the South Pacific. And he once wrote that reefs rank high amongst the wonderful objects in the world. And any of you who's ever been to a reef uh, knows that he was right. So about a quarter of all species on the planet, uh, in, the wa in marine species, spend at least part of their lives on a reef. And the result of um, experiments looking at the effects of ocean acidification, uh, and also a lot of scientists looking at the combined effects of warming and ocean acidification, because reefs really don't like warming either. You may have read recently that there have been these bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef owing to warm water temperatures. Um, and so when we look forward at the combined effects of warming and changing the chemistry of the oceans, um, the effects are pretty grim. Um, and the results suggest that reefs will not last out this century. Uh, this is really uh, pretty hard to overstate the importance of this, right? Because something like a quarter of all marine species uh, spend part of their lives on reefs. And in times in the past when reefs have collapsed, this is associated with some of those great mass extinctions of the past. So this is just a quote from a bunch of British um, ocean marine biologists. It is likely that reefs will be the first major ecosystem in the modern era to become ecologically extinct. That's not considered a radical statement anymore. That's a pretty mainstream idea. So another way that we are changing the planet on a geological scale, and this is the last one I'm going to talk about this afternoon, uh, though unfortunately I could go on, um, is just by moving species around the world. So I'm sure that everyone in this room is familiar with the idea of an invasive species. And I was uh, last year in uh, New Zealand, where this is a really, really huge issue. And New Zealand is sort of an extreme case because it's very isolated like Hawaii, it's, it's actually a group of islands, um, not just one island, two big islands and many smaller islands. Uh, and before humans arrived on these islands, uh, New Zealand had no uh, terrestrial mammals. It had uh, a couple of species of bats, uh, but no mammals that lived on the ground. So it didn't have any you know, mice or rats, it didn't have anything like a deer or a, be or a bear or a cat, nothing. And humans changed all this very, very fast. So this is a, a, a rat, a Pacific rat. As you can see, it's kind of um, cute as far as rats go. Um, and rats were brought, this Pacific rat was brought to um, New Zealand by the Maori around the year 1300, so around the time of Dante. Uh, the Maori were the first people to arrive. There were no people in New Zealand until uh, until Italy was already well into the Middle Ages. Uh, so this uh, rat was brought purposefully. The Maori intended to eat the rat, um, but the rat had other plans for itself. Uh, and they multiplied, and they spread a lot faster than they could get eaten. And along the way, they encountered a lot of um, birds that had evolved in the absence of mammals. And so they, these were flightless birds, uh, flightless rails, flightless ducks, flightless geese. Um, and since they had evolved without mammal, mammalian predators, they had no defenses against an animal like a rat. Uh, and they were very, very quickly wiped out. And then the Europeans came uh, in the 1800s, um, and they brought with them more rats. They brought with them ship rats and Norway rats. Uh, and these were accidental uh, introductions. 
Um, but then the, the English uh, also brought with them animals that they wanted to have in New Zealand, that they missed uh, from Europe. So, for example, they brought rabbits, European rabbits. They were going to go rabbit hunting. Uh, and these rabbits also um, multiplied like crazy. We have a, a saying in, in, in English, I don't know if you say it in Italian, to uh, breed like rabbits. Um, and so these rabbits bred like rabbits, and they just overran the countryside. And New Zealanders, as you probably know, are sheep farmers. Um, so these rabbits were really eating a lot of farmers out of their livelihoods, and they were very upset. And they put um, a bounty on the rabbits, so they tried to kill as shoot as many as possible, but it didn't make any difference. Uh, so uh, someone got the bright idea of um, bringing in um, what are called stoats, uh, short-tailed weasels. Um, I don't know if you have them here in Italy, but they're, they're European species. Um, in the U.S. we have long-tailed weasels, but as you can see, uh, they look like extremely good hunters. They are extremely good hunters, um, but you probably guessed already. Uh, they didn't go after the rabbits. What they did go after were the rest of New Zealand's birds. So this set off another wave of extinction on New Zealand that is still very much going, ongoing today. And I'm just going to show you a couple um, of species that survived long enough so that we have specimens of them. Uh, these are birds called hui. Um, they're very interesting birds, as you can see. It's a male and a female in this slide. Uh, and they have very different shaped beaks. And the, the theory is that they hunted together, the, men, the males and the females, uh, and that they could hunt different kind of bugs with those different beaks. Um, this is also another really interesting bird. This is what's known as a Stevens Island wren. Uh, it's one of the very few examples of um, a flightless songbird that we know of. Uh, and it, all, it survived until the early part of the uh, 20th century. Um, <clears throat> so moving species around the world uh, is something that we do all the time. Um, a lot of you probably have uh, non-native species in your garden uh, at home, um, and you have non-native species as, as pets, maybe. Um, it's once again, it's something that strikes us as pretty ordinary. Uh, but when you think about it, um, it's something that's really very, very uh, extraordinary, very, very new, um, because without a lot of help, it's very difficult for a land species to cross an ocean uh, or for an ocean species to cross a continent. So what we are doing when we move species around the world is we are bringing together these lineages that evolve separately, in some cases for tens of millions of years, and we're bringing them together you know, very, very rapidly. And when you do that, you would not be surprised to learn that you can get some very nasty results. Uh, and we have a very good example of that where I live in the US, in the northeastern US. What you're looking at here are, are bats. They're called little brown bats. They're, they're our most common kind of bat in the US. Um, and they have what's called white nose syndrome. You see that sort of white powdery stuff on their noses. Um, Perhaps you've heard of this. Um, it's a pretty big deal in the US. It's killed off millions and millions of bats. Uh, and it's caused by a fungus. It's a disease, a fungal disease. And the fungus doesn't just affect their noses. It gets into the wings of these bats uh, that hibernate over the winter. Uh, and it irritates them. Uh, and they wake up, and they have nothing to eat. Uh, and they drop dead, uh, really, by the, by the millions, as I said. Um, <clears throat> so. <clears throat> this fungus has been traced back to Europe. Uh, it was probably brought over completely unwittingly by some tourist. Um, and European bats seem to carry this fungus, but they are not affected by it. Uh, and the disease arrived um, in the US, somewhere not far from where I live. I live in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and this is a picture of me uh, and a wildlife biologist in a cave, once again, in the northeastern US in Vermont. Uh, and you can't see it because, um, unfortunately, it's very dark, or maybe fortunately, it's very dark in this cave. But we are standing on a carpet, a couple inches layer of just dead bats, uh, because this was a cave where hundreds and th of thousands of bats used to hibernate. Uh, and so now this fungal disease is now in uh, more than half of the states in the US, and it's also in several Canadian provinces. So <clears throat> this bringing. Um, together of species from different continents uh, is another way that you could say that we are running geological history backward and at a very high speed. Um, so around 200 
uh, and 50 million years ago, all of the continents in the world were squished together in one giant supercontinent called Pangaea. Uh, and then, owing to the wonders of plate tectonics, they broke up, uh, and we got the world as we know it today. And so by bringing together these lineages that evolved on separate continents, um, you could say, uh, and you sometimes do hear biologists say, we are in effect uh, creating uh, the new Pangaea. So now um, I'm sort of near, near the end of my talk here, and if I were following the usual rules, I would now uh, tell you what uh, we can and should uh, do about all of this. But as I uh, warned you at, this, at the top, um, I don't have that sort of ending this afternoon. So instead, I'm sort of going to um, end where I uh, began um, with another very um, charismatic um, but sexually confused bird. So this is a bird um, named Sirocco, and I met him when I was in New Zealand. Um, he's what's known as a kakapo. Um, kakapo are another example of these really interesting flightless birds you get in New Zealand. He's a flightless parrot, the world's only flightless parrot. Uh, they're very, they, he's a big bird, about this big, about the size of an osprey, uh, and very beautiful, and as you can also see at the same time, um, a little bit comical looking. So kakapo used to be everywhere in New Zealand. Um, there are accounts from the 19th century. They are what's known as lek breeders. Um, they make a lot of noise during breeding season, the males. Uh, and you have accounts, as I said, from the 19th century where people complained they made so much noise you couldn't sleep. And now there are exactly 126 of these birds left. And all of them, except for Sirocco, live on these two little remote islands which have been cleared of rats, where they've gotten rid of all the rats and other mammals. So, but Sirocco, when he was a chick, he got sick. So a little bit like Kanoe, the Hawaiian crow we met at the beginning, he ended up getting raised by people. And he was also uh, imprinted or yeah, affected by this experience. Um, and so when he reached sexual maturity, he uh, wanted to mate with people. Um, and as I say, kakapo are pretty big. Um, they're also nocturnal. So you had these people, these sort of volunteers, uh, and also wildlife rangers on these little islands who were trying to help bring back this population of kakapo. Uh, and during mating season, in the middle of the night, uh, Soraka would fly at their heads uh, and try to mate with him. So it was decided that for his own good and for the good of everyone involved, um, he would have to be removed. And so he now lives alone uh, on his own sort of private island. Um, but sometimes he goes out on tour so that New Zealanders can see him. Um, and that is where, um, because except for Sirocco, they will, they will never see one of these birds. And, and that's where I saw him when he was on one of his tours. Uh, that picture was taken um, actually by a friend of mine. Uh, and you're looking at him through a very thick uh, plate of plexiglass. Um, and Sirocco, I think, uh, once again, is another sort of emblem of this very strange uh, world that we are creating. Um, it's not because humans are, are vicious or indifferent, um, although we are certainly capable of those things. Um, but as your presence here this afternoon testifies, we also have uh, many other qualities uh, curiosity, uh, concern, uh, caring. Um, and ultimately, I think we actually have a lot in common uh, with Kanoe and Sirocco uh, in that we ourselves are confused uh, creatures. And that's where I'm going to end this afternoon, and thank you very much. Thank you. Abbiamo imparato, abbiamo imparato un sacco di cose e un po' ci siamo spaventati anche. A parte l'ultima vicenda del povero uccello che cercava di accoppiarsi con questi signori. Che... Il problema della discendenza è un problema che le dinastie dei eh, sovrani in Europa hanno avuto per molti secoli in genere trovavano qualche ramo 
di discendenti, diciamo, laterale, che riusciva poi a soppiantare la famiglia che non aveva discendenti. Non so se questo possa essere un modo per risolvere i problemi dell'estinzione. Io proverò a fare una domanda, poche domande, perché poi vorrei anche lasciare a, a voi la possibilità di fare domande a Elisabeth Colbert. Eh, una prima questione, un po', diciamo, per provocare un po' una discussione. Eh, riguarda quello che nel libro viene si ricorda essere un termine che prima non aveva un'accezione un negativa, il catastrofismo. Il catastrofismo è diventato negativo come espressione eh, successivamente. Eh, però nel mondo di oggi l'idea che siamo vicini alla catastrofe può produrre, anzi ha prodotto, una vera e propria industria. E io non parlo tanto delle questioni eh, naturali quanto per esempio quella che si potrebbe definire l'industria della paura. Il pubblico si spaventa, eh, cerca di informarsi per scacciare la paura, questo aumenta l'ansia del pubblico e per esempio io faccio, facciamo tutti e due lo stesso lavoro in modo molto diverso, i giornali che si occupano di cronaca nera, che mettono al centro la cronaca nera, di que su questa paura del futuro vivono, fanno fanno dei soldi, hanno, hanno un interesse. Esiste anche un altro catastrofismo che è quello più intellettuale, cioè l'idea eh, che noi eh, ci raccontiamo che stiamo per eh, estinguerci e questo eh, ci porta a pensare che qualsiasi modo di immaginare uno sviluppo umano, un eh, modo con cui l'umanità modifica comunque, per il solo fatto che esiste l'ambiente che ci circonda, sia un'idea negativa. Allora, la domanda è questa. Noi viviamo in uno strano mondo in cui da una parte abbiamo Stephen Pruitt che è diventato il, presidente del, il direttore dell'EPA, dell'ente della protezione ambientale americano. E per riassumervi, noi ridevamo in redazione quando abbiamo saputo questa notizia cioè che Trump ha deciso di mettere Dracula alla, alla presidenza dell'Avis, perché effettivamente <ride> Pruitt è uno dei sostenitori del, della tesi per cui tutto quello che abbiamo sentito oggi non esiste. Ed è il presidente dell'agenzia americana che dovrebbe occuparsi della protezione ambientale. Quindi abbiamo questo estremo, Dall'altra parte abbiamo l'estremo di chi pensa che qualsiasi modifica dell'ambiente sia, una modifica, sia un, un modo per arrivare verso l'estinzione. Eh, e quindi in mezzo a queste due possibilità non c'è l'idea di un possibile sviluppo in cui l'uomo modifica inevitabilmente l'ambiente, ma in modo positivo. Siamo costretti invece a vivere tra queste due alternative terribili, cioè tra Trump e la conservazione eh, delle, del, di quello che c'era prima. Ok, è stato meglio? Ok. I want to say a couple things to that because it, 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 it is always. Sorry, it is. Al can, can people hear me? Yep. Um, This idea that you know human humans are going extinct, and 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 this is when I when I published this this book that was a question I got a lot. You know, was I was I predicting the extinction um, of humanity? And I want to be very clear that I that I am not. If if you were saying to yourself, um, you know, what's a, a species that's doing well today? You know, a, we have a record population of humans right now, 7.5 billion people, and uh, heading very rapidly toward aid. In fact, I was just um, looking at my notes, and I saw that, you know, I, I had written 7.4 billion people, and I went to check if you, there's a world population clock that you can look up, uh, and just in, like, the last couple months, it had hit 7.5 billion, right? So we'd added another 100 million people to the planet. So you'd say that is a species that's doing really well. And one of the points of, that, of writing the book um, was to bring into 
a consciousness, and I certainly am not you know, the only one or the first one, many, many people are trying to bring this issue into consciousness, that we, when we simply take you know, resources uh, from other species, when we cut down the rainforests, uh, all of these things are, we are unfortunately in competition with other species. Now, you can say, that's inevitable and there's nothing to be done about that at the point where you already have 7.5 million billion people on the planet and there's something unfortunately true about that. There is a lot of, um, there's no way to keep 7.5 billion people on the planet uh, fed without a tremendous impact on other species. And I don't really know how we should go forward. I don't, this is precisely why I didn't end my book and I didn't end my talk today with a sort of prescription for humanity going forward. I think we're in a very, very difficult situation. I think we are in a, at a point where we are going to start to undermine uh, our own support systems. We're going to start to see you know, terrible droughts in parts of the world owing to climate change, for example. Uh, that's going to increase you know, migration uh, into places like Europe. Um, so I think we are going to be undermining the stability of our own societies. Uh, but that isn't to say that humans uh, are facing extinction. How's that? <laughs> well, that's another question. La seconda domanda è questa. C'è un'ipotesi invece di trasformazione. Noi abbiamo visto prima i dinosauri perché sono, diciamo, gli esseri estinti più, più ricostruiti, più vicini a noi, anche dal punto di vista temporale. I dinosauri non sono spariti del tutto, sono diventati degli altri animali. E sono, ci sono dei rettili oggi che sono il coccodrillo, per esempio, piuttosto che eh, ci sono del, degli animali come l'iguana, ah, forse è meglio fare così, ecco. Ci sono degli animali come l'iguana che ha, diciamo, è in qualche modo erede di tutto ciò. Anche l'uomo è il risultato di una trasformazione. Eh, quindi anche noi ci trasformeremo, prima o poi, in maniera drammatica o graduale, però noi ci trasformeremo comunque in qualche cosa. Eh, non è possibile immaginare che cosa saremo tra, tra non so, mille, due, no, mille anni sono pochi, diecimila anni sono un po' di più. Cioè, noi cominciamo a vedere già oggi i, se, i, si, i segnali, i segni di una trasformazione dell'uomo come lo conosciamo oggi, parlando con tutti questi scienziati con cui lei ha fatto il giro del mondo. Ci sono questi segnali? Well, If, if we're looking at, you know, sort of future evolution and, and people, people do think about this, you know, what, what will the world look like? Um, we, we are closing off a lot of evolution. That's exactly what extinction is, right? We're just closing off evolutionary possibilities. Um, so you have a tree of life and many, many branches, and we are cutting off a lot of the branches. And if you look at the results of the last mass extinction, um, when the dinosaurs went extinct, uh, we actually don't have any descendants of dinosaurs right now, right? Crocodiles were their own, they're their own family. Um, we have uh, birds, uh, which are closely related to dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs, and birds survived. And But dinosaurs, you know what we consider dinosaurs, there are no descendants of dinosaurs anymore. And um, a theory, a very plausible theory, is that you know, the age of mammals came after the age of the dinosaurs, that we ourselves are sitting here as human beings because of that extinction event. A lot of room was left, a lot of ecological space was left open, and mammals, those mammals that survived, because a lot of mammals also died out in that event, uh, they were tiny little creatures, shrew-like creatures, and they evolved, and eventually we got ourselves, okay? Now, what will happen at the end of this event that you know, we are causing and where will this all lead? Um, that is really, really, really hard to say. But one point that I think is worth thinking about, uh, because we do value consciousness and intelligent life, we ourselves are descendants of apes, right? We descended um, from some you know, common ancestor with the great apes that are around today. Chimps are our closest relatives. 
Um, and chimps are highly endangered. All the great apes are highly endangered. Gorillas are highly endangered. So eventually, if we keep going this way, there will be only one species of ape. We are a species of great ape. Humans are, are, are just a species of ape. There will be only one species left. And either we will leave descendants, some other species of great ape, or we won't. But we will have created this bottleneck uh, in the evolution uh, of consciousness um, by leaving only one species of ape left on the planet. So if there's a group that we should be very, very, very concerned about, uh, it would be our closest relatives because all of the great apes, uh, as I say, gorillas, uh, orangutans, chimps, bonobos, are all highly in, between endangered and highly endangered right now. Faremo la fine del giudice dei dieci piccoli indiani, quello che rimase da solo per ultimo. L'ultima questione, intanto vi dico se ci sono delle domande, eh, cominciate a, a farmi, farmi dei cenni, io adesso faccio l'ultima mia, poi eh, vediamo se ci sono delle domande dal pubblico. Una delle altre possibilità per risolvere questo problema è quella di scappare infatti anche nel libro se ne parla la possibilità di scappare su altri pianeti in realtà la, eh, uno degli scopi della ricerca del, dei viaggi spaziali che si stanno facendo è quello di cercare non tanto altre forme di vita che è visto come è andata fino adesso sulla Terra noi ci auguriamo di non trovare ce lo, lo auguriamo a loro perché forse farebbero la stessa fine quanto degli altri luoghi dove noi possiamo espanderci perché una delle cose che non si vedevano eh, in queste riprese, ma che, in questi grafici, ma che è anche come dire, una delle cause dell'aumento dell della CO2, eccetera, è il fatto che la popolazione aumenta in maniera, è aumentata in maniera esponenziale. E, e quindi, come è sempre successo nella storia dell'uomo, quando un paese diventava troppo piccolo per accogliere tutti coloro che ci vivevano, si fondavano le colonie come hanno fatto i greci in Sicilia o come hanno fatto molti altri popoli successivamente. La domanda è, è possibile immaginare di creare diciamo, le condizioni ideali su un altro pianeta oppure questo è un modo per scappare dalle nostre responsabilità? Well, this is, uh, um a, an idea that has gotten a surprising amount of credibility. Um, people like Elon Musk, um, you know, who's the founder of Tesla, uh, you know, is pushing this idea. And I, I want to say I always find it, you know, beyond laughable and a, a sign of how, how far humans will go um, to avoid facing up to the obvious. And the obvious is that, um, you know, we have a planet where we have, for example, oxygen, which we consider to be extremely useful for things like breathing. Um, and we would imagine, you know, that we could go to another planet, that that would be easier than trying to preserve the habitability of life on Earth. Um, when you think, when you just, like, think about it for a second or two, it seems like that's extremely unlikely that you're going to go to a place without oxygen, without an atmosphere, without water, without air pressure. Air pressure is extremely useful too. We evolved over, you know, um, many, many millions of years to, to be at the uh, air pressure at the surface of the planet Earth. Um, and if you go to another planet, uh, basically uh, there's no air pressure and so all the gases in your body, you know, that are dissolved in your body want to escape and you're, you know, dead within about three seconds. Um, so all of these things are just very handy to have around. Uh, and they happen to be on planet Earth. And I don't think we really have any options here uh, except dealing with planet Earth. That, that would be my own view of things. Bene, allora, eh, ci sono domande dal, dal, dal pubblico? Qualcuno che alzi la mano e dica... Ecco, ce n'è una... Ce so, una good afternoon, Mrs. Colbert. Uh, I'm not going to ask you what you think about Trump. This is not my question. <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. Yeah, yeah, of course. But my question 
as an American, as a member of the press, uh, what do you think uh, will happen? Is this plan uh, is going to succeed? Is he going to succeed in his plan? Because I think that nothing happens by chance uh, in this moment in your country. And will the democratic institution of your country uh, do something? Is there an, em an emergency strategy uh, to fix this problem? Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question, and I am very sad to say, or sorry to say, that just like you and everyone watching you know, in horror from around the world, uh, I don't think any, anyone knows. You know, um, it's, it's, it's actually the situation is sort of um, even, even worse than you, know, you, you can, might think because the people who run both houses of Congress are also pr pretty crazy. Um, so there's very little, uh, even in a pretty good system of checks and balances that we supposedly have in the U.S., there, there's very, it's very hard to see how except next year when we'll have another set of congressional elections, uh, things are going to change dramatically. Um, but I think that, uh, so I really honestly don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. We are all waiting to see basically whether the institutions of democracy are strong enough uh, to survive uh, at least until the next election. And then what will happen in the next election? Because it's not necessarily clear what even happens then. Um, so we're all just sort of wake up every morning uh, and many, you know, the, I think probably the uh, sales of sleeping pills have gone way up and we wake up every morning and look at the newspaper and can't believe what we see. Um, but it's, uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of like a nightmare, you know, really it is. And, and we don't know how it will end. So I, I wish I could give you a good answer to that question. Una, una domanda che mi viene sentendo questa domanda è perché è stato possibile che i pazzi abbiano vinto e soprattutto sull'ambiente come è stato possibile che eh, per esempio delle persone che lavorano nelle fabbriche possano immaginare che sia meglio rischiare di inquinare l'ambiente ma di non, di non perdere il posto di lavoro cioè di aver immaginato che le questioni dell'ambiente sono contro il loro, il loro interesse. Questo forse è responsabilità del fatto diciamo, che quelli meno pazzi non sono stati capaci a spiegarlo. Well, I think, I, I think that's a very good question and I ask, I ask myself that a lot um, because it does reflect on journalists. Um, you know, I, I also think we have, a, we have a very odd system of elections, in, which is hard to even explain, but, you know, he, Donald Trump did not actually win the election, as you know, he did not win the popular vote, but he won strategic states where people feel very hard hit, and I'm sure there are big stretches of Italy also where people feel very hard hit by the loss of manufacturing jobs. Um, and it's easy to blame environmental regulations um, as opposed to automation and globalization. And there, there are huge factors at work that Donald Trump is not going to be able to reverse. Um, but if you say, well, the problem is you know, environmental regulations, then you can get rid of the environmental regulations. And, and he is getting rid of the environmental regulations. And we will see the impacts of that. I think people who think that that's going to bring back manufacturing are going to be very disappointed. Altre domande dal pubblico? Grazie, grazie. Molto grazie.